Yo, what's cracking, YouTube? What's cracking, big dogs? It BDGE, fantasy football. My name is Nick. That is Noah over there. You can follow us at FBGod, at Nick underscore BDGE on the Twitter sphere. Today, we are going to dive into, I guess you can call them controversial players or guys that are getting a lot of buzz going into this fantasy season that maybe have not been talked about enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take a variety of players, quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs. We're going to look at where they're currently being drafted, their ADP per draft.com. And then we're going to compare them to players that are being picked around them. So sometimes it'll be the same positional players. Sometimes it'll be just overall player pools. We're going to break down that player, what we think about that player. And then we are going to choose, you know, amongst that guy and the three or four other guys that we named going around the same draft spot, who we would rather have on our team. Now it's, it's going to have to be in a vacuum because obviously we don't have the rosters up. If you're in the 12th round and you're deciding between quarterback X and running back Y, it would probably you know depend on what your current team looks like. But we're going to do the best we can for you. Uh, Noah was cracking, man. Welcome back to the HQ. You're coming on here every Tuesday. Uh, this is the second one. Is uh, is the schedule good? How are you liking this this Tuesday upload, man? I'm liking it. I'm liking it. The first one went pretty well, I think. I saw a lot of positive comments. Uh, also saw some constructive criticism, which I totally agree. You know, I need to work on a few things here and there. But overall, it's going pretty well. I enjoy it. You know, get the summer off, get a dive into fantasy football. Uh, I'm just ready for the league and the season to start. Me too, man. I'm itching. You can't, you can't make everyone on the internet happy, man. Yeah, it's, it's difficult out here. I'm being called the public. I'm just getting shit on, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, but we do have a high hit rate in the uh, in HQ, though. We have, hey. we have a very positive hit rate. And we're going we're, we're gonna to continue to get better, so stick with us. We are on our five-video-a-week schedule. Noah will be on here every single Tuesday, breaking down weird, unique topics. If you missed last week's episode where we broke down all of the biggest offensive linemen impacts and changes throughout the offseason free agency NFL draft, that was a really good one. We go in-depth on that. So um, go, go take a look at who, you know, who kind of mixed up their – they're big men up front throughout the offseason, and that'll probably help you, you know, deciding running backs and whatnot. So let's dive into the episode today. Um, let's, you know, let the intro take us away because normally we forget to make a little pause <laughs> there. So let's do that. All right, so first off, we're going to start with Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, currently being taken as the QB 18, pick 133, meaning he's going early 12th round. You know, typically with this pick in the 12th round, you're not getting much value. You're kind of banking on upside. If you look at players going around him, Naheem Hines, like a satellite back for the Colts, uh, Peyton Barber, who got a ton of touches last year, but buzzed around the uh, Buccaneers campus saying that Ronald Jones is going to make an impact, which I'm not sure either of us believe. <laughs> Um, and then Tyrell Williams, these are just like three positional players who are going within like five plus or minus five picks of Dak Prescott. And then to compare to other quarterbacks, all these guys are going ahead of them. We got Lamar Jackson, Phil Rivers, Josh Allen, and Big Ben. And Nick, I know you're not the biggest proponent of Big Ben. Um, what are your thoughts about him in comparison to Dak Prescott? You know, it, as we're getting into more of – uh, a fantasy space where well, I'm trying to push super flex leagues upon people. And I do believe that in a couple of years, super flex will be the norm. And for any of you guys that are beginners, super flex is just when you have a flex spot in your lineup that allows for a quarterback to, uh, to be started. And 99% of the time you start a quarterback in that second slot. So it's almost as if it's a two quarterback league, making these quarterbacks a lot more valuable. So when I look at one quarterback leagues, there's a few things to consider, right? A guy like Big Ben, where, you know, you don't necessarily want to take him because, in my opinion, I think there will be regression. They'll go a little bit more run heavy. He has um, those home and away splits, right, where you kind of know when to start him and when not to start him, which makes him a, a, not a terrible choice in one quarterback leagues. However, you know, the quarterback position is so replaceable in one quarterback leagues, right? If some guy doesn't work out or if you take, like a Lamar Jackson, you, you take him for that upside, right? And, for, you know, he gets hurt or he just isn't performing that well. Drop him, go grab somebody else. So when I'm looking in one quarterback leagues, I pretty much dismiss a player's floor because you don't, you know, you don't have to acknowledge it. You never have to have that floor in your lineup for more than one week. You can get rid of him right away. 
Um, so when I look at Dak Prescott, he always seemed like a guy that can give you a good floor, right? He was an okay passer. Sometimes he gave you that rushing upside. But I, I think last year we saw more upside than we ever have out of him, right? He had like four or five games where he was putting up 27 or so points. There's not a lot of quarterbacks that do that in fantasy. So when Cooper came over and his numbers just kind of exploded over the second half of the year. I'll, I'll put up the split right now if you guys want to look at that. Yeah, so the numbers exploded, right? He was using Zeke in the passing game more. He was using uh, Amari Cooper as like a true number one where Michael Gallup should have been a compliment the entire time. Um, you know, we saw a mix of both floor and and ceiling out of Dak Prescott. So he's someone that I'm I'm super intrigued by, not only in one quarterback leagues, but also in like dynasty because he's so young and he's probably going to get that extension now that Wentz got his extension. Um like, he, I think he's a very, very super underrated quarterback, especially where you said he was going off around uh, quarterback 18, which is ridiculous. So <clears throat> if I'm choosing between the two, I'll take Dak Prescott. But I will caveat by saying I don't think Ben is that bad of a pick in one quarterback leagues because you know when to start him, when not to start him, and the quarterback position is very easily replaceable. Yeah, the thing about Big Ben that I want to bring up is obviously last year he had a career year, right? He had the most attempts of his career, most yards, most touchdowns. It was a high, vol a high volume passing offense. Now he loses Antonio Brown. Um, he didn't have Le'Veon Bell last year, but it would obviously help his upside if he did have him this season. But the thing about Big Ben is if you're going to pick him, he's going 10 spots ahead of Dak Prescott. If, if you're thinking about picking him there, why not just wait one round, replace him with a guy like Paris Campbell who's going around there, Trey Burton if you're waiting on a tight end. Why not just wait on Big Ben who's probably going to put up the same numbers as Des Dak Prescott? or maybe even worse, because as you said, Dak does have that floor. He's put up 280 rushing yards each season of his career. And Nick, I know you're going to like this. Only two, on, two other quarterbacks have done that the past three years, 280 rushing yards or more. Name two of them. Wait, wait, wait. Two, two quarterbacks have had yes. 280 rushing yards or more? Yeah, these past three seasons. Um, I'm going to go with Russell Wilson. No. Okay, Cam Newton. Yes. And uh, you're going to love this. <laughs> 280 yards. Who's like semi sneaky athletic? That's oh, not he, he's not sneaky at all. Who is it? <laughs> Blake the Snake Bortles. <laughs> <laughs> the goat. Yeah. But the thing about Blake is like even last year, right? So you're, saying you, so you're saying you take Blake over Big Ben? Yeah, and Jared Goff. But the, the thing about Blake Bortles is even last year, right, he's not a good quarterback and he didn't have many weapons, but his rushing upside made him like a plug and play in certain weeks. And with Dak Prescott, he's obviously a better passer of the ball than um, Blake Bortles was last season. He has more weapons and just that rushing upside. He has 18 rushing touchdowns over the past three seasons. So, you know, a rushing touchdown is worth like one and a half times as much as a passing touchdown if you're playing in like a standard four point passing touchdown league. He's had so, six every year, right? Six. Yeah, six every single season, yeah. Which is crazy because when you look at quarterbacks, you're like, oh, you know, you can't repeat that. It's so volatile. But Dak has literally had six rushing touchdowns in all three NFL seasons. While, yeah. Zeke, while Zeke is so heavily fed on the goal line too. So it's not like, you know, there are seasons where like Zeke, for instance, you can look at him this year and say his touchdowns are going to go up, right, just based on the number of carries he got and how, much, how many touchdowns he usually scores, you know, on a per-game basis. He did not – come anywhere close to those numbers last year. It's like, okay, his numbers are going to go up. But we've also seen seasons where Zeke's had those double-digit touchdowns, averaging one touchdown a game, and Dak has continuously put up, you know, six touchdowns throughout the season. So it's a really nice rushing floor. Yeah, I mean, he leads the league or leads all quarterbacks in rushing touchdowns over that span. And along with that, like, Zeke is being used in the passing game. He had 95 targets last season, which is something he hasn't been, like, used a lot in the first couple years of his career. Um, they get a new OC who's a little bit more – who we don't really know yet, but he's probably going to be a little bit more pass-friendly than uh, Scott Linehan. You know, Kellen Moore, he's a young uh, – used to be quarterback for this team. He was drafted when he was, like, 28 years old. The goat. So, yeah, dude, I don't know. Just, I love that, like, NFL teams keep drafting players that are like, <laughs> like what the fuck do you think is going to happen? Case Keenum did something once, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, he's young, and, you know, he, he was a quarterback himself, and he's been around Dak Prescott, so he knows his strengths. He knows his weaknesses. That'll probably play a little bit to his benefit. And you look at after they brought in Amari Cooper, before that point, they were passing on only 54% of their plays. After that, it bumped up to 59%, which is near league average. I'd expect much of the same this year, which just gives him more of a 
a solid floor, like throwing to guys like Amari Cooper and Gallup on a more consistent basis. And obviously the rushing floor we saw before. So yeah. all in all, I, I just think that Prescott has a really high floor and we've seen him finish as a QB one each year of his career so far. So the ceiling is definitely there. Yeah, dude, the snacks would say the ceiling is the roof. I think this is the year that, like, the Cowboys can put it together. I know everyone gets hyped about them every year, but they have a legit defense. Their offensive line is going to get those healthy pieces back. Um, the weapons are pretty good there. Yeah, Jason oh, Witten's there. I want to know how the fuck Russell Wilson ha- was not in that category. Like, this is definitely – like he, wasn't, he, had like 200, he had, like, 250. I only used 280 because I think that's what Dak Prescott oh, had oh, as oh, a rookie. Okay. I was going to say, like, this must have been a stat that you completely finessed because I'd be yeah. doing that all the time. I'll be like, only fucking two <laughs> wide receivers have hit 80 receiving yards, but there's like 17 of them that hit 79. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> I saw the Tyler Boyd one. <laughs> that's how you finessed the big facts. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, at least I let him know that, like, I could have just put, like, Tyler Boyd had 100% of their 40 plus yard receiving yards last or 40 plus yard receptions and not put that stat underneath it where they only had one fucking reception. But, my man of the people, not of the public, of the people, of the big dogs. So um, let, let's let's look at the other quarterbacks that you named and some of the other players and uh, decide who we would take in that situation if we're on the clock. All right, so Lamar Jackson kind of offers the same floor as Dak Prescott, obviously a little bit higher because of the running, but he doesn't have the arm that Prescott has shown on occasion. So I think between them, it's very close. I know a lot of people have him ranked as like a QB1 heading into this year. Let's just name, Let's just name them and then choose who we get. All right, we got Lamar Jackson, Phil Rivers, Josh Allen, Big Ben. Um, so I know Rivers, no disrespect to you. Rivers would be my last because, like I said, the floor is just not what I'm looking for because there are so many options on the wire that would give you a high ceiling. All you have to do is hit on one of them, and then you find that one like high ceiling quarterback for the rest of the season. So Rivers is off. Big Ben's probably going to be off my board too. I like these rushing quarterbacks. Um, I will give that – nod to it, it, it's close between Lamar Jackson and, and Dak for me um, I'm probably going to go with Dak although you know I, I've said I don't really like the floor but I think um, I, I think they have a similar ceiling Maybe, obviously Lamar Jackson probably has a, a higher weekly ceiling just because he can break out a 70 yard run or something uh, but Dak's floor you know if you are going to start him I think is, is something that is a little bit appealing to me so I'd go Dak there out of all five of those guys yeah, I agree. And I don't hate you putting Rivers in last because you ranked Josh Allen above somebody. So there's a little respect there. Got you. I, just, I mean, any way you're going to look at it, you could have been like, <laughs> I don't hate you for putting Josh Allen last because you put Rivers ahead of him. Like, you yeah. Could have swung that. That's finesse right there. You're learning, man. You are yeah, learning. just cherry picking everything I can get. Yeah, I agree with you. Lamar Jackson does have a really high floor. And, you know, they uh, added Marquise Brown and uh, Miles Boykin, two really athletic guys, as well as Justice Hill, who catches passes. So, yeah. He could have a much better, like, passing attack this year in Baltimore. Um, we saw, like, Mark Andrews was their number one last year. And if Mark Andrews is your number one, you don't have a number one. So, <laughs> Dude, I like Mark Andrews, man. Mark Andrews is going to surprise a lot of people. I do, but, like, I don't know. Like, they were leaning heavily on him last year. Now that they have more pass catchers, obviously his ceiling is there. So, he's also being picked um, ahead of Dak Prescott. So, I think in a vacuum, if you're just taking in, uh, into account ADP, I'd rather just have Dak Prescott a little bit later for like similar outside. I'm with you. All right. Next up, that's the only quarterback we got. So we're going to jump in to running backs, a very controversial one that either you love him or you hate him because you drafted him or you picked him up off waivers week 18 or whatever, late in the season. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Derrick Henry, running back 16, 28th overall, going early third round pick 3.4 if my math checks out. It probably doesn't. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm going to let it slide because someone will let you know. Yeah, I'm the public. Um, players going around him right now, which is I find extremely surprising. Keenan Allen, Adam Thielen, T.Y. Hilton, George Kittle is only five picks ahead of him. And then running backs around him are Marlon Mack, Damian Williams, and then Fournette and Freeman, who obviously uh, injury concerns are baked into their ADP. Yeah, so that's that's like my issue when it comes to Derrick Henry. It's not so much the Derrick Henry overall. It's just the guys that you have to surpass in order to get them. Mm-hmm. When I look at those names, my overall strategy, and I, you know, I've been talking about this a lot lately, and this will probably be a very big part of, um, of, of the Bible that I put in the draft guide later this year, is that those, those mid-rounds, man, and we see this year over year, those mid-rounds of, of running backs, like the third, fourth, fifth, sixth rounds are just littered with – 
guys who end up being bombshells and just don't pan out for the year for whatever reason, right? Um, they got that Lisa Ann bust. Exactly. <laughs> that was super busty. <laughs> and you look at the wide receivers going in the same range. There are, there are even wide receivers going around later than where Derrick Henry is there, like the Stefan Diggs's, Kenny Galladay's, the Brandon Cooks that are just so safe, you know? And it's like, would you rather have them with a staple of your team and hope that Derrick Henry works out? But if he doesn't, you're kind of fucked, right? So when I look at Derrick Henry, it's not so much that I hate the player, which I do because he doesn't catch <laughs> passes, which makes him super game script dependent. It's more so the situation that you find yourself in the draft of guys that you're giving up on. And in that particular situation, like, I look at the, I look at Derrick Henry and I see the small sample size, which is something you almost never want to go off of because we have about two to three years of sample sizes. Like you look at other elite running backs that break out, right? You're like, oh, you know, the Joe Mixons are ready for the breakouts. Like Joe Mixon completely took over the workhorse role last year, and that would be the next step, you know, in in line for breaking out. It's not like, okay, he had a 32 year old Demarco Murray ahead of him, and that's why he didn't break out. It's like, no, dude, if you're a good enough beast at the age of 22 like you should be commanding that workload right it shouldn't take you 14 weeks into your third season to get there still not catching passes people still are sleeping on Deion Lewis as a guy who caught almost 60 passes last year yeah and last year Deion Lewis had 210 touches and he even he was used on the goal line he had five really? uh, rushes yeah. inside the five compared to Henry's 13 which obviously it's like only like 30 percent but still a guy who's 250 pounds shouldn't be losing touches to a guy that's like 190 exactly and you look at um you look at like, I mean, Deion Lewis, I'm sure those numbers were more heavily skewed in the in the first, you know, half, three quarters of the year. But still going into the new year, it's like, I, I can't expect them to, to only ride Derrick Henry. Like he will get a lot of volume over the first half of the year, I'm sure, but it's still going to be a pretty shitty offense, an overrated offensive line. Just, I don't know, nothing about Derrick Henry makes me want to take him over like eight of the guys that you said pretty much. Yeah. And the other thing about Henry, right, is Typically, with when a team has a good defense, like the Tennessee Titans do, and uh, I'll use like the Cowboys as an example, they had a good defense and they run the ball a lot, which means that they dominate time of possession. If you look at what the Titans did last year, they were 22nd in time of possession. They weren't really dominating on the ground, and now that they add pieces in the receiving game and the fact that their offense wasn't good last year, it's not like they're going to give Henry 25 touches a game, which is kind of what you need for him to return value, being a solely like a one and two down backer. Uh, you need a running, t- a rushing touchdown for him to like return RB one value, which is almost where he's being picked at. Yeah, exactly. Like you, in order for your running back to get twenty five touches in a game, one, he's gonna have to catch like four or five passes, which Derrick Henry doesn't do. Two, you know, okay, he can get twenty five carries, but you know how good of a game script you're gonna need in order for your running back, your one running back, you know, not even excluding Deion Lewis's touches. You need such good game script. You need to be dominating teams and. I think we can all agree that Tennessee is not an offense that's going to come out there and dominate opposite teams, right? I, I am, I'd I imagine they're going to do a lot of things that we saw in, like, Arizona's offense last year where 65% of their first down runs are just feeding it to Henry right up the middle, hard nose um, carries, which are going to go for two, three yards, and those don't push the needle. So you're going to get, like, six carries a game that are just that, that are, like, into the fucking lineman's ass and then poof, like, it's done, right? So – I don't know. Um, let, let's name some of the guys going around him and, and talk about if we take Derrick Henry over any well, well, first, I want to put up this, like, little chart, just the final four games compared to the rest of the season. And as you said, like, they're not going to be dominating teams. If you look at the teams he played over those final four weeks, he played the Jaguars, the Giants, the Redskins, who had an a- AAF quarterback at, like, <laughs> under center. And then the Colts, he did pretty well. But, you know, he was RB, I think, 22 on the week. So he was just within, like, a top 24 running back and like 25% of his fantasy points came against that one game against the Jags. So yep. it, you're completely right about they're not going to be dominating games. And in the games that he did do well, it was against teams that they like blew out of the water. Yeah. And those are all teams that were out of the playoffs. Like Derrick Henry was getting 12 to 15 touches a game. Like he had pretty fresh legs by the end of the year. Well, these defenses are not motivated. They don't have anything to play for. Right. If they were, you know, if they were playoff contention teams, at the time, and they're like, we got to stop this guy. Like, okay, I buy into it a little more, but he's a 230-pound back with fresh legs going against defenses that are unmotivated that have been playing the entire year, like full-time snaps. It's just like, I don't know. I see too much wrong there for me to go anywhere near a third-round pick on Henry. 
All right, yeah. So the running backs going around to right. Marlon Mack, obviously, whatever. Um, Damian Williams, and then Leonard Fournette and Freeman are both going behind him right now. So okay. of those four, I'm, I'm interested to hear. Them. I'm interested to hear like who of those those final two, Fournette and and Freeman, you would take. I would I would actually take Henry over Fournette and Freeman. For Marlon Mack and Damian Williams, it's not close. Like those yeah. two are in a tier so far ahead of those other three that you named for me. Um, but I think I would slot Henry into that third spot right ahead of Fournette and Freeman. I think they're kind of in the same tier, but the fact that he doesn't have injury concerns makes me feel a little bit better about him. Yeah, all three of those guys, I agree with you there that Fournette and Freeman, their uh, injury concerns are too big to pick them, like RB17 and 18. Uh I just think all of them should be slotted like five spots back. So I I agree that Henry should be in front of them, but they're all just being overvalued. And then a few spots behind them, we got Aaron Jones and Kerryon Johnson, who I would both I would pick both of them ahead of Derrick Henry. Um, I would throw Carryon Johnson ahead. Uh, I'm I'm still very torn on Aaron Jones. Um, I went fucking nuts on my video that's coming out. If this video is out on Tuesday, yesterday's video about running back rankings, I, like the reports coming out about Aaron Jones and the body fat that he lost. Yeah, that's really, ridiculous. He went from eleven to five point three. He was at like two hundred and five pounds. If he lost six six and a half percent body fat, he's going to be one hundred ninety five pounds coming into the season. I, I don't I, I don't like. They're going to use a running back by committee, no matter what. There, you know, it comes down to like, do they use him correctly? If Aaron Jones gets like fifteen touches a game and they let him catch three or four balls, like he could be a really, really, really good version of like Terry Cohen or something. You know what I mean? And put up ninety to one hundred total yards a game. But most of it has to be through the air. Like if they don't, if they don't utilize him and, and just shove him up the middle a lot, like fuck. I like Aaron Jones a lot. I just, I just don't like the situation. So, oof, that's really tough. I, uh, I would probably, if it's half PPR or full PPR, I guess I'd lean Aaron Jones. But it's very close for me. Yeah, and these rankings are half PPR that I'm using. So yeah, I agree that it's kind of close, but I just think like being in a better offense and he was utilized a little bit more in the passing game last year. I think it uh, slots him slightly ahead. But right. as for the would you rather question, I'm going to put all these at the end. Uh, it's kind of like an ADP check or like um, an opportunity cost thing. We've got Darius Geis going as the RB29 30 picks later. And obviously he's not, he, he probably won't have the same opportunity as Derek Henry just because they still have Adrian Peterson who wants 2,000 yards. Uh, with that mentality, he'll probably tear his ACL next week. But um, just if you pass up on Henry, you can get a combination of Darius Geis and Adam Thielen instead of a combination of Derrick Henry and Jarvis Landry. So I'll, I'll put these at the end and just show like what what kind of value you can get by passing up on these guys that uh, we're naming off the top. So that's that's a good um, that's a good way to look at it too, guys. I like that you added that in there. It's almost like you always have to look at the opportunity cost when you go with one guy. Look at uh, another running back that you like that's going later and then find out a wide receiver going in the same range as that first running back and kind of flip the script there, right? See how he did that? He went Derrick Henry and Jarvis Landry or Darius Geis and Keenan Allen or Adam Thielen or something like that. Um, and just make it like subjective to you because you're going to like different guys and we like get different situations. But I think that's a really good way of uh, trying to plan, you know, where to attack certain players in drafts. All right, so next up, we have a running back who I love and you probably like a lot because I saw you tweeting about him. It's Austin Eckler, running back for the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, RB44 overall, pick 112, going in the 10th round. Uh, people picked around him, D.D. Westbrook, Geronimo Allison, and there's also a bunch of quarterbacks, so I'm not sure if we want to count them. It's like Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, uh, Jameis Winston. It's like the QB, like 9 through 12 around there. And then running backs around him are also Ido Smith, Jalen Samuels, and Kareem Hunt. Mm. So, I mean, if you look at those running backs, right, Ido Smith is kind of in a similar situation as Eckler, but we've seen Eckler produce. Uh, Jalen Samuels, same thing, but Pittsburgh has shown that they want to use, like, one running back. And, you know, James Conner down the stretch kind of wore out a bit, and when Samuels was brought in, he he showed, like, he could be used both in the passing game and in the running game. So I don't think it's going to be a 90-10 split between them. It will probably be close to, like, 70-30, 70-30, like a, a little more evenly split than a 90-10. And then Kareem Hunt is going to be out for the first eight weeks of the season, um, nine counting the bye. So pretty much I, I don't know why he's being picked this high. Do you have like any clue why Kareem Hunt is being valued where he is? I have no idea either. It's ridiculous. Like it, when I'm doing my best ball drafts on draft.com, his name continuously surfaces right around where you're saying like that ADP. And I, I don't think 
I've done a ton of best ball drafts and I've tried to diversify my teams on every time. Like every time I, I, I realize I'm not picking a player, I try to grab them in like the next draft or something. I don't think Kareem Hunt has been that player at all until he falls into like the 12th, 13th, 14th round. I don't think I'll even be looking at him. Uh, a couple names that jumped out to me there. <clears throat> you know, I like Eckler. Jalen Samuels is a guy I'm very intrigued by at that spot. Um, other wide receivers I think you named were Geronimo Allison. And D.D. Westbrook, yep. D.D. Westbrook, okay. I, I actually like those guys too. I like a lot of those guys going in that mix. Um, Geronimo Allison intrigues me a lot because he was like the clear wide receiver too there on the outside in Green Bay before he got hurt last year. And his number, his per game numbers were very good, right? He was averaging like five or six catches a game, 70 to 80 yards. I think he scored one or two touchdowns. Um, and then he got hurt. So that's the problem, obviously. He hasn't played a full 16 yet. I think he played like seven games, 11 games last year, five games. So he is far from someone who has stayed on the field. And I'm not actually sure why he missed games in the first year or first two years. It could have just been that he was on like the practice squad or something and they got promoted. But last year was obviously the health. Um, I do think he'll open the year. Like they didn't that, – that's, that's in a very intriguing situation to me because behind Devontae Adams – who I actually think I – was, I was writing up on my wide receiver rankings video yesterday. I, I think Devontae Adams has a chance to go for 190 targets and, like, 130 catches this year. Like, deadass, I think he has a, a chance to, like, break records. Yeah, Roger said he wants to target him more, which I'm not sure how you could do that. He said that last year, too. He's like, we need to get <laughs> Adams the ball more. Like, after – he'd be getting, like, 16 targets a game. He's like, the guy is literally always open. I'm like, dude, he's going to – I uh, yeah, I think Adams might just, like, smash records this year in PPR leagues. But um, you, they didn't add anything there on offense, which is so surprising. Just, um, Jace Sternberger, but, like, even then, yeah. rookie tight ends, what do you expect out of them? Yeah, wide receiver-wise, like, nothing stood out to you last year. Like, behind Demonte Adams, it was like Marquez Valdez-Cantling had a little bit of hype after the first couple of games, but he completely disappeared over, like, the last six, eight games of the year. Equinemia St. Brown made a couple plays, but like nothing was even close to consistent or sticky out of the wide receivers behind Adams. And the fact that they didn't sign like a John Brown in free agency or, or sign anyone, like even like a Dante Moncrief, I think would have been, you know, an intriguing fit there. They yeah, they let have... Cobb walk too, so. Exactly. Like it tells me that they, they, have, they, they have confidence in these guys behind them. I, and I, I can't really figure out why. And Rodgers definitely has a say in that, right? Like he's the one who's deciding – who he wants to throw the ball to. And he's it's almost like the LeBron James of the NFL now where, you know, he says what kind of goes because he's the engine behind the entire Packers organization. So it's like there's something there that the Packers really like. And uh, and I, I want a piece of whatever it is they're talking about. So uh, I'm going to keep an eye on Allison very strongly. The injury risk is very real. So I'm probably not going to be dipping into any rounds like earlier than where he's going right now, like the 10th round or so. But historically, the wide receiver two in an Aaron Rodgers offense has averaged nearly – and if you pace out his numbers from the first four games last year, they're like 80 catches, 1,200 yards, and eight touchdowns. Like really, really ridiculous numbers. Obviously, stupid to, you know, pace it out to a full 16 games, but like that's, that's really where they were at. So um, if Allison is, you know, the clear number two on this team, he's going to give you like six games before he tears his ACL and gets out. Those are going to be a really good six games, man. Yeah, I like that comp between Aaron Rodgers and LeBron James. The only main difference is LeBron uh, downs a whole bottle of vino, and <laughs> Rodgers, as we saw, can't even finish half a cup. So, well, James doesn't chug that. I had imagined him <laughs> being as bad as at chugging beer. Most likely, yeah. So, uh, as you said, yeah, I actually kind of wrote an article a while back about Allison. So, a little shameless plug there, if you want to read it. It's, you know, it, it was like a deep sleeper thing, but I have much of the same sentiments about Allison, but. Uh, as for the running backs around him, if you just look at what Eckler has done, like last year he proved, I'll put up the splits with and without uh, Melvin Gordon. I believe it was three games that Melvin Gordon was out when Eckler played. Mm -hmm. If you look, the numbers were very similar when he was and wasn't there. And obviously when Gordon's off the field, you want him to, like, you want Eckler to be that RB1 replacement. But picked as the uh, running back 44, if he can put up, like, top 15, top 20 numbers, what is there to complain about? The guy, he, he averaged, like, almost 13 points a game when he was gone and, like, 12 when he wasn't. And, like, the touch uh, differential between those two when he was and wasn't on the field, obviously it's much bigger. But we've seen things out of, like, Lamar Miller where when you get more touches, you become much less efficient. And there's a bunch of PFF stats, and I don't want to run through all of them. I'll put up pictures of them to make it a little bit easier. But it, uh, through the passing game, you know, he, he was fourth in yards after catch among running backs. And, uh, watching the charges, you see him used outside, like split out, and also uh, in the screen game, third in yards per route run, 
So he adds value in the passing game. And then the running game, he led the league in rushes of 15 plus yards, uh, a percentage of uh, rushes going 15 plus yards. It was like 9.5%, right? I think it was like 10 point something. Yeah, I remember I made a uh, like bounce back player video a, a few weeks ago, and it was like Carson Wentz, um, Marvin Jones. I talked about Austin Eckler as one of the guys, and he's legit like one of the most efficient running backs that we've seen over the last two years. He's been top five in, like you said, yards per out run, uh, breakaway run percentage, yards per carry, like all yak. Like yeah, yards after contact, yeah. Yeah, he's been top five literally in back-to-back seasons. Obviously, like the workload is small, but that's – that's who he is. He's like – he's the perfect player to grab this year because, okay, Austin Eckler has a top 15 year this year, which is not an absurd thought to happen if he plays 16 games. Yeah, RB26 last year on points per game basis. Exactly. And, you know, then you're going to have to pay those – that top 50, top 60 draft capital price next year, and that's when you don't want to buy them, right? Mm-hmm. You buy the scat backs when they're the cheaper ones, and then you let the guys who are coming off of big years – go early in the fourth fifth round like the the James White and we saw like the Chris Thompson the year before everyone's getting hyped around him and then boom like that 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 stuff continually happens so the guys that are very volatile that aren't necessarily giving you high volume you buy them at the cheaper price you don't buy them at their peak cost yeah and just going off of that right Jarek McKinnon this is one I was like surprised about the dis- the difference and the disparity between their picks McKinnon's RB39 so it's not like a huge jump up in price but what's really the difference between these two guys, right? Neither of them are – I would argue that McKinnon's in a much worse situation. That's, I think, yeah. I think Reed is the most talented back there, and I think I, – I almost, I almost don't know what McKinnon's role is going to be, to be honest. Yeah, and Coleman, I guess, right now is the only one that's healthy. So even if you think McKinnon – if you do believe he's the most talented running back there, they didn't pay Tevin Coleman and they didn't keep Matt Breida to give McKinnon 20 touches a game, let alone 15, right? And that's uh, – Austin Eckler last year is averaging like 10 uh, – uh, not carries, 10 touches and 11 opportunities a game. It's going to be very similar to what McKinnon's getting. And McKinnon, although we like him and we like his pass catching upside, Austin Eckler has shown the same thing, but Eckler's actually been efficient with his touches. Like, Jarek McKinnon, year in and year out, hasn't really done too much with his touches. Like, uh, when Adrian Peterson went down a few years back, and even when uh, Dalvin Cook got hurt, he wasn't averaging four yards a carry. The guy, he couldn't do anything on the ground. And if you do expect him to be the lead back, what do you really expect out of those touches? Yeah, the San Francisco Niners backfield situation is one that's like they're, they'll probably – at the end of the year we're going to look back, and we might even have two top 20 running backs, two top 25 running backs, but, like, they're, it's going to be impossible to figure out when to start them on a week-by-week basis. And, like, looking at the end-of-season numbers is not what helps you win in a season-long league, right? You have to be able to have some sort of consistency. So um, I, I think be very wary of that situation. The way I look at that backfield is – I'll take the cheapest one, and that's Matt Breida, which is great because I also think he's the most talented one back there. So in the 13th, 14th round, I'm hitting that fucking cop button in every best ball draft. So um, let me ask you something. What do you, how do you feel about Justin Jackson In because you're a Chargers fan? I think he's he's not like a big back, right? He's He was used a little bit on first and second downs after Gordon got hurt, but yeah. he didn't really show too much. Like he, He's a one-cut back, but he's also elusive in the open field, but he wasn't really consistent. And I think everything that he does well – Eckler can do better so yeah. I don't I don't think if Gordon ever goes down or god forbid they let go of him or like don't want to pay him I don't think J- uh, Jackson like a seventh round pick is ever gonna usurp touches away from Eckler to the point where Eckler is a worse value than Justin Jackson yeah that's the thing I, th- I think people think Justin Jackson is like just Melvin Gordon and he'll fit in there I'm like dude Justin Jackson is not that much bigger than Austin Eckler like they're yeah. like almost the same size and <laughs> and you know, maybe there won't be a clear handcuff there, but what will happen is if, if Melvin's getting 20 touches, Eckler's getting 12, Melvin Gordon gets hurt, it's most likely going to be like, okay, Justin Jackson, yes, he'll start getting 10 to 12 touches. Eckler's not going to be the guy who gets 20 touches, but maybe Eckler's numbers go from 12 touches a game to like 14 or 15. So he's not like the clear handcuff in the sense that he slots in and gets that volume, but it will boost his game a little bit. And he's the guy, in my opinion, that I would absolutely like having in that backfield. I mean, based on ADPs, that's the way the public is looking at it too. No one wants Justin Jackson over Eckler. But anytime I mention Eckler, people are like, Justin Jackson is the handcuff. I'm like, dude, Justin Jackson is is Austin Eckler light, man. Like, you guys, what, like, what are you watching that I'm not watching, you know? Yeah, and even if they do get the same touch distribution, right, I still think Eckler's going to get more through the air Right. then Jackson gets through the air, which gives him more value in his PPR leagues. Like we saw last year, even after Gordon went down, I think he caught seven balls against Tennessee, uh, the game overseas, right? 
and Justin Jackson wasn't used too heavily then, and he wasn't efficient, but he still put up a pretty good game just because he can add value through the air, which is pretty like impressive that he's going this late. All right, so rattle off those names to me, and I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick one. All right, Ito Smith, Jalen Samuels, Kareem Hunt, plus Eckler. Oh uh, yeah, Eckler. Um. Ooh, that's tough. That's really tough. It, it's so close for me between Eckler and Jalen Samuels. I think I'd actually lean with Samuels just because I <laughs> I think I think that there's a lot going for Samuels. Um, I, and he also has size of a workhorse, and we saw him get the workhorse load when Connor – here's the thing, too. If people are worried about Melvin Gordon's injury concerns or whatever, right? Like Melvin Gordon has missed multiple weeks in three or four seasons. But so was James Conner. Like, he ended his rookie year with, like, I think it was an MCL tear maybe with a knee injury. And then last year he missed three weeks as well. So if you're worried about, you know, Melvin Gordon being injured, I think James Conner fits the role too. And if James Conner gets hurt, if he misses time, like, James Samuels is the guy who's going to fit in there and do what he did towards the end of last year. I also think he takes a lot of passing work. Um, his Just AB gone, a ton of targets open up, right? Yeah, his college coach comes in and and um, and is now like a running backs coach there, so he knows him well, and he had over 200 receptions at his time in college. So I, it, it's very close for me, but I'll take Samuels. Just Eckler will probably be a safer play, um, but I, I think I'm less risk averse as the draft uh, as the draft goes on, and I'm probably looking for more upside in the later ends uh, later ends around. The one thing I will say that I like that is going for Eckler is Eckler's probably once you have him on your team, he's not a guy you're going to drop because he gives you week over week basis. We could very much go into the year and James Conner can, you know, have 80% of the touches in Pittsburgh backfield for weeks one, two, three. And then all of a sudden you just want to drop Jalen Samuels where I don't think that'll ever happen for Eckler. So I'll take Samuels by a slight edge just because I like the upside there. Um, but it's, it's very close. Yeah. I think we can both agree on two things. One, Ito Smith and Kareem Hunt like aren't in the same conversation as these two. And the other yeah. thing that, both uh, Jalen Samuels and Eckler should be taking, uh, being taken higher than they are right now. Yeah. So, okay. And I, I, I would choose Eckler, but I, I don't hate that pick of Samuels. I have them. I, I would put them very close next to each other too. All right. All right. Um, next up, we have Cooper Cup. Now this is contingent on his injury, right? If if he plays Week One, obviously his ADP of uh, pick number fifty three in the fifth round. It, his his injury is baked in right now it's saying he's playing week one but obviously if you're drafting now you're a little uh skeptical but we're gonna we're gonna break this down as if he's playing uh week one uh people chosen uh around him james white uh Kenyon drake Tariq cohen chris carson a lot of running backs are in the same uh tier and then wide receivers around him we got tyler lockett mike williams and calvin ridley so Two of those three guys had unbelievably efficient seasons and then Calvin Ridley. And in my opinion, if if Cooper Cup isn't hurt, it's no debate. But with with the injury history and the injury he sustained late last season, I think it's a little bit closer between those three. Um, yeah, this is really tough. The reason – okay, I, I'm probably going to be off Cooper Cup, but I – you know what sucks? Like there's not one name in there that I'm like, okay, I want that guy over Cup. The problem with Cup is when you look at – someone tweeted it out. I'm trying to find it, but I, I guess I didn't like the tweet, so I can't find it under my like tweets. So Cooper Cup tore his ACL in week 10 last year. Or week, was it week 12? No, I think it was 10. Okay, so he, he tears his ACL in week 10 last year, right? That process is normally like a 10-month, 11-month process to rehab from and come back full full strength. And he might be on the field week one, but I don't – expect him right okay so week 10 you need 10 to 12 months to recover that puts him at the very best at like week two week three full strength you know yeah um, and probably more likely around week five ish you know week six maybe that you're getting cooper cup cooper cup and we don't know if we're going to see that all season right it might take him that full year dr jesse morris was saying like it's a mental thing too once you fully come back and he thinks that this upcoming year Cooper Cup needs to be very much devalued from where he's currently going. And then like next year, 2020 is when you can start eyeing Cooper Cup again, because he'll probably be cheap because he probably is coming off a year in which he was down a little bit. So um, with Cooper Cup, like I know we're, we're going to assume that he's playing week one, but I'm going to assume he's not full strength for a long time, for a long period of the season. Um, and also if you push a player to get on the field too early, when he's not at full strength, the re-injury likelihood is much higher. So with Cooper Cup, 
Like, yes, he's fun because he's the cheapest of those three Rams wide receivers and you want to have someone there. But I'm actually probably fading Cup if he's in that range. I don't like any of the running backs there, but I like Calvin Ridley. He's someone that I, I didn't like going into the offseason because I was like his efficiency numbers are ridiculous. But I, I love Dirk Cutter coming over there, not as a Falcons fan, but from a fantasy perspective because look at what that Tampa Bay offense has been the last three years. It's like just chuck the fucking ball. And Jameis Winston is – so much less efficient than a guy like Matt Ryan. So I think it's going to be like all systems go down the field for Calvin Ridley, Matt Ryan, Calvin Ridley, Matt Ryan. Calvin Ridley is a guy who runs a 4-4-40, uh, right? So why can't Calvin Ridley beat a Sean Jackson? Why can't he go 60 for 1,009 touchdowns this year? I, I, I can absolutely see that happening. Um, and he was a rookie last year. So he was actually splitting snaps with Muhammad Sanu. This year, Calvin Ridley is going to take over that 75, 80% snap roll get more volume than he did last year. And I just think that his the, the number of deep ball targets he's going to get is going to be so much higher, almost like a, uh, like a Will Fuller. Obviously, Will Fuller scored touchdowns at a ridiculous rate for Sean Watson. But, like, um, I, you know, it's crazy because Ridley's not a guy I would normally go after. I don't like volatility in my, in my lineups for season long at least. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit higher on, on Calvin Ridley as, as the weeks go by. Yeah, I agree on Ridley. Um, I think – in my opinion, I would still take Cup ahead of Lockett and Williams. Ridley, I would of these guys, I would still take him um, ahead of Cup just because he's the number two in a very high-powered, uh, looks to be like an efficient uh, passing attack next year. And in a later video, we'll talk about how Matt Ryan plays indoors a lot next season. But I think that plays to his upside. And as you said, Dirk Cutter coming over. Um, the passing volume will definitely be there for Calvin Ridley to be a little bit more consistent. He might not put up like 10 touchdowns again, but he'll have more uh, volume through – uh, targets, receiving yards, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you there. And then the the reason I put Cooper Cup, obviously I said it's contingent on his injury, is just because I still don't think people think he's like the number one receiver on this team. And the targets may not speak to it, but as a rookie, he led this team in targets. Now, Brandon Cooks wasn't there, obviously, so um, that could have helped to his uh, play to his benefit. But even last year, weeks one through five, when he was 100%, he had 11 red zone targets. Cup or Cooks and Wood, Cooks and Woods uh, had 11 combined. So he was really dominating, or 12 combined. So he was really dominating uh, inside the 20, and he even was second on the team in deep targets. So I think if he is healthy, even down the stretch, like if you trade for him, if like last year with Doug Baldwin, right? Nobody. He's going to be a great buy low candidate probably yeah. halfway through the year. Last year with Doug Baldwin, everything was saying he was playing week one. I even drafted the guy. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll <laughs> sour on. Uh, Cup as those memories start. Learn, to learn your fucking lesson. Learn your lesson. Bro. Stay <laughs> yeah. in line. But if, if the same thing happens where he's he's not 100% and it's obvious early on, maybe make a trade for him. And maybe if you don't want to take him at this ADP, you have somebody else do it for you. And then you move like a guy who early in the season has an easy schedule and you can get him because we've seen him be Jared Cook's favorite or Jared Goff's favorite weapon uh, in the red zone and all over the field and in the slot. So. I think he's – maybe you're right with the, the injury concerns, but I think later in the season, if he is 100%, it'll provide good value. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's all it's all going to come down to the injury concern. I'm going to have Dr. Morris back on the channel later into the offseason once we hear more reports about what's happening and stuff. But, uh, but I think that's an injury concern that people need to have a very realistic point of view on. Um, and, you know, fourth round off limits. Fifth round is – about his ADP, but I still think, you know, not enough risk is baked into that. So um, with Cup, I'll, I'll probably take Ridley over him right now, but it's very close and, and going to depend on what we hear throughout the offseason. And like like you said, like, I don't actually believe Cup is the number one target there. I think Cooks is the number one, but they don't have like an alpha. And Cup is the number one target where the targets are the most valuable. That's what I'll say, I guess. Um, and if he was fully healthy this year, Without Gurley, well, I mean, Gurley's going to be there, but, like, how effective is he going to be? They're going to be looking to pass the ball a lot more in the red zone, I, I'd assume. And uh, Cup could easily hit that, like, 12 touchdown mark had he been healthy this year. So we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll keep an eye on reports, but that's, that's kind of where my head's at right now. All right, yeah, and as for the would you rather, this one's going to be controversial, but, like, Aaron Jones and Cooper Cup or Amari Cooper and Tariq Cohen. So those are two guys, like, interchangeably Ooh. at the ADPs. Um... Damn, I would I would probably go um, Amari Cooper and Terry Cohen because I think like in that entire um, question, Amari Cooper is like 
the number one for me, probably by far and away. So I'll take the best player in that scenario. All right. Yeah. You guys put your selections in the comment section below. Yeah. I want to, I want to hear what you guys think about these, uh, these selections. All right. Uh, moving on to the second receiver, another guy who I think is extremely undervalued and doesn't have as big of injury concerns is Tyler Boyd, wide receiver, 28. Uh, he's very nice position off the board, the 69th overall pick, pick number 6.9. Uh, so <laughs> double dosage, if you don't like him now. Very uh, mature. You know, very Thank mature. You. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so players being selected around him, we got Hunter Henry, Andrew Luck, Lamar Miller, Eric Ebron, and then wide receiver selected around him. Um, I'm using draft.com, and right now there aren't many being selected like within five picks. There's only two. We got Robbie Anderson, who's being uh, selected four spots behind him, and Allen Robinson four slots ahead of him. So he's, he's kind of all by himself on an island uh, in terms of ADP right now amongst wide receivers. Um, I love Boyd. Boyd's a, a very, very intriguing player for me this year. And I, I would take him over those wide receivers for sure. Robbie Anderson and Allen Robinson. The other players, though, um, what what was his ADP? His overall and stuff. Uh, 69th overall. How could you forget? And then, uh... well, I'm fucking mature. I'm like, <laughs> I can forget. So, okay, that's 69th overall is the beginning of the sixth round in 12 man leagues. Obviously, it's almost like the seventh round in 10 man leagues. So, depending on where you're at, I I kind of like that middle that middle section of the draft because of the tight ends you can get there. So Hunter Henry would be very intriguing to me over a guy like Tyler Boyd, only because I wanted to grab one of those top tight ends early in the drafts, right? Like I wanted to grab Ertz or Kittle in the third round, but the hype has moved them into the second round. I've rarely seen them drop into the third round in any of the best ball drafts that I've done. So uh, at that price, I won't be paying up for Kittle or Ertz. And if you're not in like, you know, if you don't have a uh, an early – Second round pick, you're probably not going to get Kelsey either. He's usually top 12. So I probably will miss out on the first three tight ends, which means like I'm going to have to grab a tight end in the middle rounds because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to bank on like David Njoku or Chris Herndon or something being my tight end one this year. Hunter Henry's a guy that I've been targeting because he keeps falling to this like that 70th, 80th pick. So depending on how the team is made up, I, I would be looking at Hunter Henry over Tyler Boyd there, to be honest. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Hunter Henry, but I, uh, we'll get into the tight ends later, but I think there's um, a couple good value picks later that if you if you would rather pick Boyd, you're not losing too too much at tight end. But um, as for like breaking down Boyd, last year through the first uh, eight weeks of the season, that's when AJ Green was on the field. He was actually better. Um, he was the wide receiver twelve over that span, and I'll put up the splits with and without AJ Green. Um, typically, when you see an alpha receiver like split uh, the field with a guy like Tyler Boyd you'd expect numbers to be worse, right? Because he's taking away targets. He's taking away red zone looks. But he was actually on a much better pace when he had that alpha receiver because he wasn't taking on uh, number one cornerbacks and he wasn't asked to be on the outside as much. Um, also, another thing working against him is Andy Dalton got hurt bringing in Jeff Driscoll, who's more of like an Olympic sprinter than a quarterback. So uh, I'll put those splits up too if you guys are interested. It's, it's the same story as it is with A.J. Green. When he wasn't on the field, when Dalton wasn't throwing on the ball, he was a little bit worse. But even when he wasn't on the field, he was putting up decent enough numbers, right? He, he played against pretty solid defenses. Um, the only time he finished outside of the top 36 with Jeff Driscoll there was when they played the Chargers, who uh, they're a team that uh, they were bottom five in fantasy points allowed to the position. And they have cornerbacks like Casey Hayward and uh, Desmond King just locking up on the outside. So uh, his show, he showed his floor in quite possibly one of the worst situations last season. And now being picked as like a back end, like a middle, uh, wide receiver two, uh, taking into consideration that like the former president Zach Taylor is stepping in as the head coach, and they didn't add anything in the draft. They picked up Stanley Morgan through undrafted free agency, but uh, it's you still got to hope he makes the team. And the only uh, pass catcher they picked up was Drew Sample, I believe, a tight end who got not even he, a pass catcher. He's more yeah, of a he totaled 250 receiving yards once in his career. So um, things are really looking up for Boyd. He's he's set to see like more volume um, than last year when he was with Driscoll and without uh, A.J. Green. And the Bengals have this stigma, like they're not a good team in real life, right? But in fantasy, they produce a lot of a lot of good weapons. And especially with this new um, guy coming from the Sean McVay coaching tree, the passing attack should be a little bit more diverse, just further opening up opportunities for Boyd. So I think wide receiver 28 is kind of criminally underrated for him. 
Yeah, I'd love to slot him in as my wide receiver three or flex. Like you grab, you know, I don't know, Joe Mixon round one, Julio round two, and then in that round three, you can grab carry on Marlon Mack. So you got your first two running backs, and then rounds four or five, hammer solid wide receivers like Brandon Cooks, Kenny Galladay, like I was saying before, Robert Woods, whatever, Calvin Ridley, and then, you know, grab your tight end, and then Tyler Boyd's sitting there. So you can get him as your as your three or your flex, right? And like you said, Zach Taylor's coming over from the Rams. So, like, he could necessarily be, like, a Cooper Cup, right, in that offense that doesn't actually have a third weapon. So he should see even more volume in that sense. He's a guy that, like, he gives you a nice floor being one of those big slot receivers as we're seeing the NFL shift more to that being, you know, uh, the central piece of a lot of offenses. They short up their offensive line. We don't know what we're getting from Dalton, but Dalton's not, you know, he's not one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. He's For a slot receiver, he's going to be able to get that guy his targets. I'm not worried about that. A.J. Green I'm way more worried about um, in, in that offense. But Tyler Boyd is a great floor player that will give you games of, you know, 7 for 105 and a touchdown. So he has, it's not like he doesn't have a ceiling. Yeah, and the guy put up 1,000 yards last year in 14 games. It's not yeah. like he hasn't shown he's a really good receiver. 14 games, yeah, that's, like, ridiculous. He could have easily went over 1,100 if he had one big game, maybe 1,200 yards, and you're probably looking at him as a, as a fifth-round pick instead. And, uh, and yeah, I really like him as a, as a sneaky play this year. You can get in the sixth or seventh round, which is crazy to me. So uh, I'm in on Boyd. Um, again, it will come down for me if I'm choosing between the guys that he named earlier – come down to roster construction and what I did prior to the uh, earlier in the draft, but um, Boyd and Henry would probably be my targets there. Yeah. And as for the, would you rather question, it's a wide receiver and running back combination. Would you rather have Sammy Watkins and Tevin Coleman or Tyler Boyd and David Montgomery? Yeah. Fuck that. Give me Tyler that's, Boyd and David Montgomery. That's pretty close. I think I would take like both of those guys like straight up over the other. <laughs> both in the third round. I don't know how Coleman's going anywhere near Boyd in like a three way time slot. That's crazy. What's his ADP right now, Coleman's? Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. I thought it, I thought it was late, but I guess maybe I'm – Well, <laughs> it just popped up Corey Coleman, 217. Uh, Tevin Coleman's 71st, so he's going two spots later than uh, Tyler Shit. Boyd. I yeah, know, that's, that's not even uh, – I wouldn't – yeah, okay. But, yeah, give me Boyd and Montgomery all day and tomorrow. Let's, yeah. let's, uh, let's get this cracking. All, all right. right fucking ice cubes and shit <laughs> all right mike williams last wide receiver that we're going to talk about wide receiver 23 pick number 55 overall i'm a chargers fan and i don't like this one bit the guy he's been well first off he's being picked around evan ingram darius geist Tariq cohen Kenyon drake and wide receivers around him are tyler lockett uh not riley ridley uh calvin ridley cooper right. cup and then 10 picks later are alan robinson and dj moore so he's being valued around like really good number twos or number ones on their own team, which I personally don't agree with. Yeah, that, I mean, this is very similar to us talking about Cooper Cup because there are a lot of game, a lot of guys in the same situation. And like I said, if I was taking Ridley over Cooper Cup, then I'm obviously taking Ridley over Mike Williams here. I mean, you're a Chargers fan. You don't like it. I, I think Mike Williams is a, a good wide receiver two for an offense. Um, I you know, we have Hunter Henry coming back, who's going to play a very big role in the red zone. And we saw how much Philip Rivers loves to utilize the tight ends down there. So I think that's the big thing. It's like, yes, Philip Rivers, I mean, uh, Mike Williams will get more overall volume and targets playing the wide receiver two without Tyrell Williams there. But like, what's the, what's the bigger upside here? Is it the fact that he's going to get more volume on the outside without Rivers? Or is it more of a downgrade that Hunter Henry is going to be back and Williams probably gets less work in the red zone, end zone area? You know, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, you brought it up before about how this was the first time Rivers ever had a receiver with double-digit touchdowns. It's no coincidence that their only tight end on the team was an ice cream truck with no fucking brakes or a steering wheel in Antonio Gates. Like, they, had, they didn't have, like, a big body receiver in that area of the field. Like, Keenan Allen still gets looks there, but – like, other than him, Mike Williams, like, dominated. And they still use running backs very heavily, too. 28% of their targets in the red zone went to either uh, Eckler, Jackson, or Melvin Gordon. And um, just overall volume, Tyrell Williams doesn't really get the same looks that uh, Mike Williams is going to get. Tyrell was used, like, more um, as a deep threat, where Mike Williams doesn't really have that speed. He had a few, like, nice deep catches. He had a touchdown against the Rams. I'll mm-hmm. never forget. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he, he's used more towards, like, the line of scrimmage and, like, boxing out defenders. So I'm not convinced that, like, all those looks are going to go his way. And on top of that, right, that one game against Kansas City where I stayed up all night to watch that shit, <laughs> he, he had three touchdowns. If you look at what happened that game, Keenan Allen was out, Melvin Gordon was out, and they were just forcing him the ball. 21% of his fantasy points came out of one game that happened at the end of the season that probably give people a little recency bias, like, oh, look, look at his upside, look what he could do. Look who wasn't on the field, not to mention uh, Hunter Henry wasn't playing either. That's a great so, point. 
yeah, Phil Rivers had to choose between him, Tyrell Williams, who's built like one of those dancing things in the car parking lot. Like <laughs> he wishes he looked like Robbie Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's out of town, but like. I don't know. The upside definitely isn't there, right? Hunter Henry comes back for those red zone looks. Keenan Allen has 39 red zone uh, targets over these past couple of years. They use running backs in the red zone. That's where a lot of his volume came from last year. And if you're expecting that again this year, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. Like, I don't, I just don't see that happening again. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much out on Mike Williams at that ADP. Yeah. And as for the wide receivers around him, I think you said you'd already take... Um, I'll take Ridley, yeah. Yeah, Ridley. How about Lockett? Because he's kind of in the same situation, but I believe Lockett, he's like the number one option on his own team, though. Yeah, so Lockett's, yeah, probably clearly the number one option in their own team. And I was listening to a, a podcast by, with uh, Curtis Patrick over at the Dynasty Command Center, and it's it's one of those situations where I'm like, maybe we need to start respecting Lockett a little bit more because everyone's like, oh, his, his efficiency, his touchdown numbers are going to come down. But he's had a 9% career touchdown rate. So 9% of his catches have gone for touchdowns in his career. That's what it was last year. 9% of Russell Wilson's completions have gone for touchdowns. So they weren't above their efficiency levels last year, right? Although it might seem that way because how well he played and, you know, the other like little numbers flying around the perfect pass rating when, when targeting him. But Tyler Lockett actually wasn't performing or outperforming where he is throughout his career. So Lockett's a guy that a lot of people are going to start fading in that area. And I do think that's probably a little bit early because you don't want to have to bank on long touchdowns. But the fact of the matter is like who else is there that's going to be receiving, you know, deep, really accurate deep balls from Russell Wilson. Like DK Metcalf is there. Sure. But he's a rookie. He's going to drop some of those. He's going to deal with pressure throughout the year um, as the number one guy who's getting a lot of press coverage and whatever. But Tyler Lockett running out of the slot more is like, I think that Tyler Lockett is going to be one of those guys that everyone just says they take lazy analysis and says regression, 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 and then he has another really good year this year. So Lockett is actually, if say I, I face this decision twice, I think one of the times I would go Ridley and one of the times I would go Lockett. Yeah, and just to build off that point you said with Lockett, I'm not comparing to Juju Smith-Schuster, but in Juju Smith-Schuster's rookie year, he showed incredible efficiency on limited targets. That's what Lockett did last year. And then Juju goes into a second year, gets more looks. Sure, he's a little less efficient, but because he has more looks, he puts up similar numbers, even better. Lockett now is the wide receiver one on this team who is getting those valuable slot looks with a really good quarterback. Sure, his efficiency could take a dip, but the overall volume is going to help uh, supplant those uh, lost efficiency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for the would you rather pick, I, I really like this one, right? You could wait 15 picks for Tyler Boyd. You could wait 30 picks for Nikhil Harry. So, would you rather have Mike Williams and David Njoku or Nikhil Harry and Evan Ingram or Jordan uh, – O.J. Howard? He's going in the same, like, uh, yeah, ADP. Give me, give me that ladder pick for sure. Yeah. And if you don't like Nikhil Harry, there's Marvin Jones and um, – the name's escaped me. But you can, you can see there, there's a couple other wide receivers who are, like, the wide receiver two on their own team. It wouldn't surprise me if Marvin Jones and Mike Williams finished with similar overall numbers. Yeah, totally. The Chargers have more weapons than the Lions and – you know, yeah. it's the pass heavy offense. All right. We're at the very end of the video, guys. We, we finally made it. Eric Ebron. If, if you've made it thus long and you're enjoying, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, guys. Let's us know that you actually appreciate what we're doing here because we could be doing other things. Like, I could be fucking laying on that couch over there instead <laughs> of doing this. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're going to be breaking down stuff like this every Tuesday as well as every other day of the week. So subscribe, hit that thumbs up, and make sure you're answering the questions as uh, Noah drops them throughout the video. Let's get it. Tight ends, Eric Ebron. Yep, Eric Eric Ebron, currently tight end number seven, uh, going 67th overall, so in that Boyd range. So the players around him are going to be similar. Tyler Boyd, Aaron Rodgers, Lamar Miller, Aaron Robinson, Allen Robinson. And as far as the tight ends, the only tight end in this same like area is Hunter Henry, who you already said you you like a lot. Yeah. And I think, I think the main point on Ebron, right, is – we all know those splits with and without Jack Doyle, and I'll put them up there. And even myself, I was kind of leaning on that argument. But the thing is, Jack Doyle is a year older, and he got injured twice. So I'm not sure that these splits and these snaps are going to be the exact same. But why, what I am sure of is now they're bringing Paris Campbell, who takes away uh, snaps and uh, targets near the line of scrimmage. They take away Devin Funches, who has averaged 14 red zone looks over the past two seasons, and his uh, red zone market share has been 22% or higher. And they also showed, like, they moved a little bit more towards a running offense. Not too much. They still have a lot of volume in this offense. So even if they do run a lot more, they're still throwing the ball. But from week six on, they're running the ball, like, uh, 46% of the time, I do believe. 
So it was like, number, yeah. yeah, it was like bottom 10 uh, pass percentage in the league. So, I mean, Ebron did bring a lot of value with his touchdowns, but I'm just not so sure with them running the ball more, which could open up spots for um, Jack Duell to get out there because he's a better run blocker. And then yeah. adding more weapons, it could uh, really diminish his value because he's not going to get the same looks and the same valuable red zone uh, targets that he did last season. Yeah, there's there's two things I look at with Ebron. One, I mean, we're just we'll just ignore the groin surgery for now because we we have no idea the extent of how serious that is. Um, but that's you know a red flag. The two things you said, like the Jack Doyle thing, I I absolutely hate that argument because those were snaps in like week one, week two. Like yes, that was their plan in the beginning of the year. But by those last couple weeks when Doyle was on the field and right before he got healthy or right right before he got hurt again for the rest of the year, Ebron started playing like 40, 50 percent of the snaps. So he was eating into Doyle's workload. And by that point, Ebron had already been so good that they're not going to take it away. And I don't think going going into this year, can they depend on Jack Doyle? Like they're not going to go into games anymore with the game plan that, okay, Doyle's the 80 percent snap guy while Ebron's the 20 percent snap guy. They're they're The way they look at the game now is going to be different based on how Ebron played. The other thing. We know Ebron's touchdowns are going to go down, right? Just like normal regression, he's not going to have 13, 14 touchdowns. The fact of the matter is, though, they're still one of the best offenses with one of the best quarterbacks that targets the tight end in the red zone at a higher rate than any quarterback in the league. So Ebron, yeah, he might not score 13, but if he scores eight touchdowns, which is very likely still, like he's going to be a top five, six tight end still. That does make him a little more volatile because he is touchdown dependent. But, um, but I still think like, if he keeps dropping, right, if he starts slowly trickling away from tight end six to seven to eight to nine to 10 to 11, at that point, once he hits tight end nine, 10, 11, I think you have a very good value in Eric Ebron just because people will be lazy and just make the regression um, the regression argument. I am a little bit nervous with Devin Funches coming over. I think he'll be a red zone target. But I, I still think that, like, Andrew Luck, we've seen it every single year he plays. All he does is cipher red zone targets to that tight end position. So if Doyle can't stay healthy, I will say – it, it, this this groin injury is worrisome for Ebron. Jack Doyle is older and is dealing with his own injuries. Devin Funches like might end up really playing that in line like tight end role. He played tight end in college too. Yeah, and he might like literally score ten touchdowns this year, if not more, and be like a really really intriguing waiver wire pickup if he gets dropped earlier in the year. Yeah. So if you guys stayed this late in the video, we got a nice little sleeper right there. But yeah, as you said with Ebron, he has a, as good a chance as any to really sneak into that top five by the end of the season because of his touchdowns. The thing yeah. is, though, where he's being picked, it's near his ceiling because you, you need to rely on those touchdowns. But it's kind of a similar situation for every uh, tight end. The thing is, Vance McDonald, who is in kind of a similar, similar situation uh, after losing AB, there's a lot of targets opened up. He's going a full round later, around pick 80. And I wouldn't be too opposed to just waiting around and taking uh, Vance McDonald if you do want a tight end who has uh, immense upside like uh, Eric Ebron brings to the table. Yeah, I like, I like that like duo of, of having to choose between the two. And right now, I don't really know. I, I would pick Vance right now just because I don't know the extent of Eric Ebron's you know, groin thing going on. But um, really, like if I put the over-under at seven and a half touchdowns for Eric Ebron, would you, what would you take realistically? You had to put money on it. I would, I would put the under. I, I think like six to seven is realistic just because I think they have, they've added a lot more weapons this season. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at the top ten tight ends last year, there's only a handful of them that score. On, on any given year, there's only a handful of tight ends that actually score even that six or seven touchdowns. That yeah. almost solidifies you into the top ten. Like that, that's a floor of being in the top ten. What did Hooper have last year, like eight, and he was a top ten tight end? Touchdowns? Yeah. No way. He wasn't up there. Was um, he? Oh. Well, I'm a fool. No, he's four. That's what I mean. Like, you had 10, 8, 13. There's only five touchdowns. There's only five players that had six touchdowns or more. And they were all um, – five of those six were in the top six tight ends last you year. You have them pulled up right now? Actually, Cameron Bray also scored six. But I think we can probably assume that Eric Ebron is going to score uh, – have more than 289 receiving yards next year if he scores six touchdowns. Yeah, Kelsey – um, Ertz, Ebron, Jared Cook, Trey Burton, all scored six touchdowns. They were the tight end one, three, four, five, six in standard leagues last year. So I'm telling you, like, your guys are looking too hard at, like, numbers and regression and all this shit that you're hearing. But if Eric Ebron gets in the end zone seven times, he's a top eight fantasy tight end. That's the thing. Yeah. Do you, what would you put the over on our TJ Hawkinson touchdowns? Uh, five and a half? I would put it at five, yeah. Five. Because I, I, don't, I don't think I would bet him at – yeah, maybe five and a half. I would think he's probably closer to the four or five range. That's why I put like five on it. 
because right, I used him in the Would You Rather, and he's going uh, 50 picks later than Eric Ebron. So if you really want to wait and you don't want to stream tight end, you want a guy who could be an every week starter, we got him going four rounds later. And for the Would You Rather, we have Eric Ebron and Deshaun Jackson or TJ Hawkinson and Tyler Boyd. Hmm. See, I would I would probably go with the second one only because I love Boyd. But if you threw in like a, a wide receiver at that range, like if you asked me Robbie Anderson and Hawkinson or Ebron and Deshaun Jackson, I would probably take Ebron and Deshaun Jackson there. Yeah, I just yeah, I, I kind of put my little bias into it. But yeah, yeah if you if you're gonna motherfucker over here. <laughs> yeah, it's just if you're gonna pass on Ebron and you do have those convictions that his efficiency is gonna uh, diminish then you could wait in, uh, 50 picks for Hawkinson or just one round later for Vance. So, Yeah, as, that's the last one you got on your list, right? Yep, that if wraps it up. Yeah, if it's not, I'm, I'm going to make that list. <laughs> but uh, that, that's going to uh, wrap up the video for today, guys. Again, I ask that if you enjoyed, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing this all summer. Um, go check out BigDogsDraftGuide.com, which will have – Literally all the content that we put out throughout the summer, which is going to be like 40 videos at this point. Um, and we're going to take the most, the most precious content, gift wrap it up, throw it into the, uh, into the draft guide for you, the top sleepers, bust, must draft players, the top 250 big board, positional rankings by tiers, and like a million, a million thousand other things. We're making up numbers over here, but there will only be big facts in the draft guide. I promise you that. So big jo- bigdogsdraftguide.com. You can pre-order now. It drops July 1st. And make sure you drop a bunch of comments and help us out with the YouTube algorithm. Make sure you follow my man Noah on Twitter. His Twitter will be down there. I think it's probably been down there the whole time. And we'll see you all uh, on next Tuesday's episode.